Good afternoon, everybody. This session is how to connect Java Embedded to the cloud computing. And I'm Hinkman Wong. I'm from the Java Embedded Group. I'm one of the engineers that works on Java Embedded libraries and the virtual machine. Before we start out, we have our typical safe harbor statement. This is for informational purposes. And here's our agenda for today. First, I'll be going over an uh, introduction to cloud computing with embedded devices. So you're at an Oracle conference, you're at Java 1, you probably are already aware of the cloud computing. How many people by a show of hands have heard of the term cloud computing or know what it is? Okay, so I don't have to go too far into detail that. And then I'll go into an uh, introduction of Java embedded technology. How many people have heard of or saw my previous talk on Java embedded? Okay, just some, so I'll, I'll spend a little time, a little more time on Java Embedded. And then I'll tie the two together of what does it mean to program in Java Embedded versus a Java SE desktop, for instance. A lot of people are more used to Java EE for server or Java SE for des desktop computing. So I'll explain the programming differences specifically for the Java Embedded environment. And then we'll talk about the techniques used to connect Java Embedded to cloud computing. And then there are tools that are available to do, to help you with that and there are software suites that enable you to do that connection to the cloud. And then I'll show a demo at the end of how that software is used and it'll open it up for questions and answers. And along the way, if uh, we'll keep this informal, if you have any questions please uh, interrupt me, raise your hand and let me know what your question is and then um, I can answer it directly then. As an overview, and since most of you know what cloud computing is, this is, this is old news to you, this is just uh, the definition is using computer resources such as hardware, software, anything connected to your hardware like peripherals that are delivered as a service over the internet or over a network. It might even be a private network to your client. And the typical types of services that you know about are software as a service. So an example is Gmail. If you want to use Gmail as your mailing system, you're not going to run software on your actual tablet or your laptop PC. You're going to access Google's mail server. And all that software, instead of Outlook running on your PC, all that software is running on the Google server. So some back-end data center or over the cloud is going to run that software for you and on your device you only need a simple HTML browser. So that, that's the whole big point of cloud computing as everybody knows. It's allowing all your software to run over the network on, a, on the cloud instead. And it's interesting because it doesn't have to be just a program like a mailing program it can be entire platform. So that's what you've heard during the Oracle open world that there's also platform as a service for cloud computing. So instead of just Gmail running on the Google server, you have an entire Java VM running on Oracle's backend server and you're going to put jar files there over the network on that server to run for you, not on your PC, not on your iPad, not on your tablet. It's going to run on a Java VM across the network. So that's platform as a service. That makes it more flexible, of course. You could put anything there, not just Gmail. You could put your own applications, your own EE applications. And anything you want is run on a platform as a service. Then there's storage as a service and people know Dropbox. So you would just say, hey, here's all my photos, my music. I'm just going to drop it into the cloud. So there's some disk drive sitting in, uh, on the network somewhere at Dropbox and you're able to util utilize that as a cloud service. So again, it's, it's leveraging a computer that's somewhere else on a network in the cloud and not having to rely on your device or your client. And of course there's going to be other things that can be used as a service, not just software platforms or storage. Now how does this relate to embedded? And that's, that's our specialty in our division in, at Oracle is the Java Embedded Group. We are concerned with cloud computing for embedded devices. So we're taking the definition of allowing you to expose your resources, in our case of embedded devices, that uh, 
are delivered as a service across a network. So your embedded device becomes a mini server or you know we, we also call that a micro server. There's uh, plenty of processing nowadays with ARM based processors on these embedded devices and there's Linux running. So why not make it a mini server or embedded server running on the network and serving up your device as a service. So anything your device can do, measure temperature, measure someone's heart rate in, in a, a, on a medical device in a hospital or uh, on an industrial automation side on a factory floor, this device can now become a cloud service and not just a device you, you always have to operate and, and uh, telnet into or make some other connection into. It's going to automatically offer its resources, its hardware, its software, its peripherals as a service on the network. And so that's what we mean by cloud computing for embedded devices. Also there's a step above just your regular sensors and medical monitors. There's the concentrator concept in embedded devices. And that allows you to aggregate or to have a collection of smaller devices and serve all of those devices up as a collection and as a service itself. So the, in the smart grid world, if you have 300 homes in a neighborhood, you don't want to talk individually to each one of those electric meters in the house. Instead you want that neighborhood to be represented by a concentrator and that concentrator again will be the aggregation of 300 homes in that neighborhood and you would just have to talk to that one concentrator instead. And that could have more memory, it could be uh, a more powerful CPU on it, probably still ARM, maybe a multi-core ARM processor and still run Linux on it but that device is a little heftier and maybe it sits on a telephone pole for the utility company and not on your meter on each home. So that concentrator can also be a cloud service or uh, for in, in our case it's an embedded cloud service because it's not a big server running, it's not a big iron um, T4 Spark server running but it's this little Linux ARM device that looks like a hub that's running somewhere on a network. And so let's look at a diagram of what we're talking about here. So in the typical cloud computing, this is what you're doing if you're using Dropbox or you're using Flickr or you're using Gmail. You have on the left hand side your client computer. So it's your laptop computer, your iPad, whatever HTML standard browser you're using. It doesn't matter. It's talking that standard protocol to what's in this right hand side box and that is a one single entry point which is uh, a bunch of servers. It could be Amazon's uh, web services, a uh, bunch of clustered services running on that server. That is going to in its cloud have access to things like storage. So you might have all your emails stored on their, on, on Google's um, disk drives and th there's some type of database that's also on the back end so they can authenticate yourself and say what's your password, what's your username and allow you to get onto your account. And then you have all these different services. It might not just be Gmail, it might be your calendar, it might be your task list, it might be other things that these, uh, the cluster of servers will allow you to access. So that's typically what happens in cloud computing is that you have this very reliable way of getting to your data, getting to any type of computer resources, maybe it's, it's a Java VM running that's as a platform as a service or anything that a, a server can handle is the typical case for cloud computing. And this just itemizes what we just talked about is that there's one control, one entry point into a suite of software. So you, you might have many things, human resource software running on that, uh, on the back end data center. There might be uh, HR's way of doing performance reviews or doing payroll or doing your vacation accounting or expense reports. All that is being controlled through a URL that you go through with your client. And there's no, this means there's no need to install any type of software on your iPad or on your laptop computer. You just need your, your, your Firefox or your Safari or WebKit browser that's using that HTML5 or JavaScript standard that, that all browsers nowadays have. 
and that means the workload is shifted from burning up your CPU cycles on your laptop, it's going to be shifted to the back end data center where it should be because there's, there's big iron running there with a big server and that's going to take the brunt of all the processing that you'll need to access your email, access your photos, access, access um, anything like a Java VM on the back end. The advantages of this, again, it's easier to install so there's a, a system administrator that's on the back end in the data center that's watching all that software 24 by 7, Amazon's watching all their servers, Oracle's watching all our cloud servers and it makes it easier to manage also because you don't worry about your iPad, it's, it's just got the Safari, sur uh, Safari web browser on there and you just have to worry about updating it from Apple, you don't have to install each one of the HR applications that you're getting from your enterprise, it's going to be there in the back end and it's easier to access also. So you just need your username and password most of the time to authenticate yourself. The disadvantages are that you're dependent on the network. So if, if like at the show here we have Oracle's Wi-Fi, if it's overloaded and it's slow, you can't get to your Gmail, you can't get to your uh, Flickr account and that's, that's a problem right off the bat if you don't have that network connection. Then also your data is not local. So that means your data is owned by somebody else and it's, it depends on who you trust for your cloud computing. Um, if it's a big company like Oracle then yeah there, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of resources behind that. There's a lot of people working on it and watching it. If it's a smaller company, a startup, if it's Dropbox or, or some internet uh, dot com, do you know it's going to be there in five years or ten years? So that data is very reliant on being there up in the cloud but uh, who knows what, what's being done in that data center. As long as you're happy with uh, whoever is running that data center then it's okay. Also if, uh, if there's a crash on that, that cloud set of servers, it's not just one server but of course um, like Amazon, they try to have redundancy and, and all these failover servers that, that kick in when something fails. But still, as you've seen in the news, Amazon's cloud crashes, even though they promise it'll be up all the time because they have this great design, it's going to happen. That, that entire cloud is going to crash and you're not going to be able to get to your data. Or worse yet, your customers won't be able to get to that data. So you have to watch out for that as a disadvantage of cloud computing. And it's the same way in embedded cloud computing. You have one control point, or in our case, if you're if you're the utility company, you have one concentrator that controls all the data for 300 homes in a neighborhood in a city. So that's one point that you're going to talk to as a device or a, a mini cloud that's going to ha offer up all that data for you. So there's no need to install software because the client that you view into, if, if you're the utility company and you want to view into that neighborhood's data on the concentrator, it's just an HTML browser just like you would do for your Gmail or for Dropbox. And then there's the workload is shifted also so that those devices or the internet of things, those billions and billions of, of Linux ARM embedded processors are churning away doing some type of processing. This is really important because you're taking advantage of all this processing power that's out there on these small devices and using the distributed computing model instead of doing everything in the back end on your server. So this, this is meant for many, many types of devices that are mid to high end that have these specialized embedded uh, CPUs now that can handle processing up to that level. And the advantages are again it's easy to install because you have just your client talking to a bunch of devices. The devices are managed by uh, either um, uh, some type of um, software that looks at device management, uh, OSGI or, or some other types of um, back end software and it means it's easier to access also because you have a URL or a URI that goes to that concentrator. The disadvantages are the same as what I talked about for, for big cloud computing. 
it's dependent, very dependent on the network and you're talking about wireless networks in many cases for embedded devices. So you're, you have even uh, another level with wireless of um, things that can go wrong if it's a 3G network, if it's not near a cell tower. And then that data again is on the device and if you wanted to back up that data you need to get over the network and talk to your concentrator otherwise you, you won't be able to see that. So when you have downtime on your network then you have to realize that that data won't be accessible. And then if uh, those devices crash, especially if the concentrator crashes, then you can't talk to any of the smart meters in, in the 300 homes that represent that neighborhood. So any, any questions so far? Okay. So this is pretty straightforward also. It's uh, each device uh, is in this diagram is represented by in, in the box on the right hand side a concentrator or a set of different concentrators that can do failover type of redundancy so that when one crashes then another one picks up and is able to take over that neighborhood and, and serve up the data. And then you have all your devices. The devices could be smart meters in that neighborhood. And then you have your database storage. So your concentrator itself can be running a mini database that it keeps in sync and it just in case you crash it could recover all that data for you and if the network goes down it could also synchronize that data later on when the, in when the network comes back up. So that's pretty important is it's taking the concepts of cloud computing, shrinking it down so that it's running on a telephone pole somewhere. And then again this is uh, acting as a control point and the processing is now spread out. You can have all these smart meters be doing the processing for you. Such as figuring out the weather and figuring out the weather patterns doing predictive analysis saying hey the analytics tells me that the, there's a trend of heat rising in this neighborhood so I'm going to ramp up enough power so that the AC demand is going to be appropriate for this neighborhood. So all that analytics can be done on these telephone pole devices not on the back end server where it's far away. And let's dive deeper into Java Embedded. Java Embedded addresses the internet of things, making sure that Java runs on a variety of these billions of devices. So right now we have Java SE Embedded and, and Java ME Embedded running on multifunction printers, voice over IP phones, that's for the enterprise. On the consumer side, Java is running on ebook readers such as the Amazon Kindle, medical equipment, industrial controllers. And so that's important because that's where you see demand for big data and where cloud computing for embedded devices makes most sense. Then there's also smartphones and feature phones. That's more on the consumer side again. Um, that is not as dependent or there might be future business models where you might figure out hey cloud computing would make sense on all these consumer devices too. Uh, but right now it's, it's more of electric meters and, and you see that as, as one of the items where a smart grid would make a lot of good use of cloud computing on these embedded devices. And there's much more. There's, it's a wide open field right now where you can figure out hey if I could run services on this powerful ARM chip on this device maybe it makes sense to do certain types of operations there. And here's just the spectrum again of Java that you've seen at Java 1. On the left hand side is servers and that's where the strength has been for Java over many many years is Java EE. And there's Java SE also found on the desktop. Now in the middle here Java SE embedded is a smaller footprint so we're shrinking it down to fit in 10 megabytes or more these small devices where you want the full Java SE API. And in the old days we had Java ME CDC if, if people are aware of that. That was a subset and it was hard for our developers to switch their minds around hey can I use this java.lang API or is it missing from this Java ME CDC subset. Well now we have Java SE embedded and you don't have to make that mental switch anymore. It's just a full specification. So you just use the same tools you would use. Not only that but I'll, I'll show the, the suite of software that we have includes Glassfish. So now we, we've shrunk down Java EE to run on these embedded devices also. And so that's the big deal is that if you want cloud computing and you want all of that powerful software to do the cloud computing, 
then we're addressing that with our new suites of software from Oracle. And um, it's worth mentioning that Java ME, since it's a subset of a specification, that's meant for more vertical markets like TV and mobile phones. So if you need to change a channel or fast forward or rewind and play a video, there's Java APIs that do that for you in Java TV API set. Or if you want a, a feature phone to send an SMS SMS text message or be able to check your contact list. There's another set of APIs for that. But what we try to do in Java SE Embedded is give you a horizontal platform. So there's all the Java APIs available that you normally do for collection classes, for generics, for the language, doing things like um, Project Coin or in the future Project Lambda. That's found in Java SE Embedded, not in Java ME. So that's important if you want to keep with that latest and greatest language changes and, and the latest um, sets of APIs you want Java SE embedded. Any questions there? Okay. So uh, diving deeper into those flavors of Java, Java SE embedded, since it has a small footprint but full API specification of Java SE, that's great for large commercial and industrial use on the factory floor, in voice over IP phones, in the enterprise. And yes, there's a question here? Okay, so the question is if it's full Java SE, how is the footprint smaller? And that's because we take pieces that wouldn't make sense on an embedded system like a headless system and then we get rid of AWT, we get rid of Swing, because there's no way to use AWT and Swing. And already there, that brings it down significantly. So that's a great question, but yes, we, we do have the spec where it's going to have, take effect, like java.lang, java.net, java.io, those are all headless APIs. You can call them with no problem and they make sense on an embedded device. Yes. Uh, right now, uh, the split is uh, is headless. There's a headless Java M Java SE embedded that's a very small size, and then there's a head full. And, there, and this might be appropriate for uh, situations where you want to have a black box and, and just embed Java there without being a a full featured general platform. Um, there's a head full Java SE embedded that adds in swing but then of course you get the bigger footprint there. And I think it's um, might be 65 megabytes for that type of environment where you have all the AWT and swing and then only about uh, 20 megabytes for Java SE embedded headless. So that's right now and we're shrinking it even further down. Yes, our target is 10 for Java SE 8 embedded. Yes, uh, there's, uh, uh, so the question was is that realistic to even shrink it down further to 10 megabytes? Yes, because we're taking a lot of our knowledge and experience from Java ME CDC, which used to be a subset of the, the full specification, and we're making optimizations in our libraries. The, uh, actually, the implementation of the libraries can make it uh, shrink down even further. So if we rewrite certain parts of it, break some dependencies that used to pull in implementations that aren't really needed in these headless devices, then we can ensure that the smaller size is going to be uh, there for you for to match the 10 megabytes. Any other questions? Okay. That's all great, great questions. It's, it's a little bit out of scope since I, I'm talking about uh, cloud computing, but it's good in this part of this section of the talk because um, I'm building up to that what our platform is here. The Java ME embedded on, on the other hand is that's the subset where we've carved out even further down to leave out parts of the API so that it's appropriate for mobile devices for feature phones. And then there's Java card which is even smaller. That's got the bare minimal set of APIs and specifications so that you could just run smart card type applications or machine to machine appropriate for just a token card to use. Um, there's also cyber physical systems that use biometrics to authenticate yourself using Java card. And just to recap, it's um, Java SE embedded is that, f that full implementation of Java SE specification. 
But as, as mentioned, it has those optimizations that the engineering team has gone in there and made sure the, the parts that are using up dynamic memory and, and, and static footprint are shrunk down so that it's appropriate to fit in, in the smaller devices. And we also watch the ROM usage so that when you store it on your flash or on whatever storage device you have on an embedded system, it's not going to take up a huge footprint. Then and as a result of that, when you cache in all your classes, uh, if it has a small footprint, then it's not going to take up a lot of volatile RAM either because that gets loaded up also onto your system in terms of dynamic memory. Then we have runtime opti optimizations to make it run fast. So we make sure that the JITs are appropriate, the just in time compilers are appropriate for ARM chips. And that's very different. These RISC based chips, ARM, MIPS, PowerPC are all very different than what you find with Linux x86 and the multi core CPUs that you find that are Intel based on desktops and now on um, laptops and tablets. So we make sure that our VM is optimized in our runtime. Then you get the history of, of Java SE which is a proven and stable platform and it has a huge developer base. So we can look on the uh, online for forum groups to answer questions and we can have uh, tools such as NetBeans, Eclipse and JDeveloper help our developers for Java SE embedded because it's all the same, it's, it's all spec compliant. You can have rapid application development using those IDEs. So that helps out developers a lot right now. And then you have the goodness of Java. You have full object oriented programming. You have uh, that virtual machine that's going to run jar files and byte code the same way that you do on desktop. So you just take that one jar file and move it from one embedded device to another dev embedded device and you have that write once run anywhere uh, promise from Java and now on embedded devices also. And you have the memory management and portability and cross platform um, that you normally get with the, with the Java language. And these CPUs that are showing up that I talked about on these uh, higher end devices, they, there are ARM chips that are multi core. So you want your, your Java platform, and we do this in Java SE embedded, to be multi threaded aware and multi process aware so that it will run on these multi core environments. And you get the Java security and Java networking that you usually get with Java SE. Now, for specifically cloud computing, what features from all that I talked about for Java SE embedded would you apply? And that includes the ports because there are a wide variety of these different CPUs used on embedded devices nowadays. It's not like desktop or laptops where you only have Windows, you have Mac OS and you have Linux. So you just worry about those three environments for Java VMs and, and you're happy. On small devices you have, you have all these different flavors of Linux. You have uh, the ARM chip, you have MIPS, you have PowerPC that's all very different. And uh, meanwhile you have a very small set of um, requirements for the memory. So we want to be able to run in 10 megabytes of static footprint or 16 megabytes of dynamic RAM use. So we want to make sure that there's a small corner of your device that where Java is going to run. It's not going to take up all your resources on your device since you normally need drivers and other software running in the background on your device also. At, at the same time as uh, these cloud services. Then what we try to do is pare down some of the features in the VM also. You will have a serial garbage collector, not, not uh, both serial and parallel because a serial garbage collector makes more sense on these smaller devices. And you only have the C1 client just in time compiler which you really don't need a server compiler that's um, on these Linux ARM chips. But we also allow the option to include the server JIT. So if you want a large full feature configuration for Java embedded, um, in, in our case, people use the word embedded to mean software that's installed on a server. So even though it's not a small device, they're embedding that software to, to not get updated and not be dynamic, but just run as is one dedicated application. And that's what they mean by embedded. That 
we could use our Java SE embedded environment to do also, but instead of worrying about the footprint that it might take up that's available, it might, instead of 256 megabytes, it might have 4 gigabytes of RAM, we tried to run in a small piece of that so that the other types of software, there might be a CRM system that runs on that server, that would run in the main memory, but we take up a small chunk of it just running to monitor that, uh, that server and run in the background. And here's different types of techniques to co connect with the cloud. In one view, you can say, hey, maybe the devices should be the clients. So let's say I had all these irrigation uh, controllers in different homes and they're going to turn on and off the, the sprinklers for the lawn. These devices might want to talk to a cloud service like the weather report. So what's the 10 day weather forecast for this area, this neighborhood? And it'll give, um, you know, it's, it's not going to rain for the next 10 days. All these devices would go out to the network and, co and connect with the, the service and say, give me the 10 day forecast and say, oh, it's not going to rain, so I'm going to keep my schedule the way it is. Or it might c get back a data from the, a data set from the uh, cloud service that says it's going to rain every single day for the next 10 days. So the irrigation device would say, you know what, I'm not going to water the lawn for the next week. So that's the devices as the client. They're actually consuming the data that's coming from some big server or some cloud service that's up in the, in the internet somewhere. That's one view of it. And again, just to itemize it, the devices are the consumers of the cloud services in this technique. This means you would use the typical types of features you find in Java SE embedded already. So you need web services API. So java.net URL connection. You would connect up with a HTTP, um, type of connection to some web service for the weather report, give your user ID and password, and get back some XML, the 10 day weather forecast with the XML labels of each day. And then you would have to parse that out, figure out what the, the rain forecast would be for each day and be able to act upon it. So that's pretty simple. There's not a lot of heavy lifting, there's not a lot of extra APIs that you would need for the devices to be consumers of cloud services. And then again, it, just to summarize, that's processing data from the cloud. But here's, we'll, we'll flip that around and instead we'll say the devices are the service instead. So again, this is more like in the smart meter world where you have many, many, many devices that say that they're using up a certain amount of power and then you have the concentrator act as the cloud service. So instead you might be working at the utility company and you might use an iPad or some PC or laptop to talk to the neighborhood cloud services and say, hey, I want to take a poll of all these neighborhoods. How much power are your homes using in your neighborhood? So you're using the devices to serve up data from that neighborhood. There might be 300 in each one of those neighborhoods in the city that concentrator re report back, hey, there's heavy demand from all these people in this neighborhood because maybe the temperature has gone up and people are using their AC devices uh, and using their AC um, to, to cool down their houses. So the devices report that back and the utility company says, oh, I better increase the, the generator here at the, at, the, at the power plant. So that's using the devices as cloud services. And that's what we find more interesting because then you use the power of the concentrator or the devices that are out there, um, the internet of things to do the processing for you. And these, whoops, let me see. This is um, just a summary. The devices are the producers of the services and you need more advanced web service framework to do this. You need servlets because instead of going out to some server and using a URL to get to it, you are going to offer up servlets from your embedded device. And you need a web service framework. So some easy way of saying, here's my web service, I'm going to publish it, here's a well-known way of getting to my data. And then you need XML formatting so you're putting together all the, these XML tags and all the data that you're collecting on your device. 
and you need some type of local storage. It's better if it were a database since you need that syncability and being able to recover if your device ever crashed or rebooted out in the field. And this is offering data to the cloud instead. So this is more interesting. It seems like if, if you're doing this, the, the internet of things, the billions of devices out there are more interested, uh, are more interesting if they produce data. And what's one way of doing th that with uh, software? And one way to make it more convenient is that we bundle together uh, pieces of technology and call it Java embedded suite for cloud computing. Well, for cloud computing is this talk here, but it's called Java embedded suite 7.0 from Oracle. And this allows you to aggregate, store, and transmit your data securely to and from these small devices. And that does it with four components in Java embedded suite. We have the runtime, which is Java SE embedded 7. And this is the VM and the class libraries that you normally would run your Java applications. Then there's Java DB. So if you need a way to store and get to all that data in an organized way, you have a database, a mini database that's on your device. And Glassfish has been shrunk down also to fit on these smaller memory constrained devices. So you have a, a Glassfish implementation and you have Jersey web services. And th this is just a, a convenience uh, way of doing your, writing your web services and developing your web services. I'll show that in a demo later. And we bundle that all together to run on these smaller devices with less memory. And so where would you find this useful? You would find it useful in embedded devices for smart grid, healthcare, for industrial automation. And again, it's addressing devices with less memory and lower power CPUs. But there, there needs to be a network for these, this cloud computing and what we're finding now is wireless is becoming prevalent for the networking type. Uh, if you're putting it on a, on a power pole, if you're putting a smart meter on your house, you have some type of either Zigbee or 3G network use where many, many companies are now piggyback on the, the carriers that have unused bandwidth. So Amazon with their Kindle, they piggyback onto the Sprint 3G network. They call it WhisperNet. They just kind of brand it differently. But what it is is the unused part of the Sprint 3G network and this is pretty s smart on Sprint's behalf because they said, hey, not everybody's using this, the 3G network. It's, it's got some unused portion of it. Maybe we can resell it. And then they resell it to Amazon and they are able to have all their Kindles talk machine to machine, M to M, to the back end Amazon server to get all the data updates and all the books that you want to read, it gets downloaded over this 3G network. And that becomes their private 3G network that Amazon uses even though it's, it's a, a piggyback on top of Sprint. So you, you see that in many cases nowadays is that uh, Sprint or AT&T will offer up part of their spectrum to you if you want to contract out that. And then you have smaller screens. So you have to worry about the UI, making sure that if you don't have AWT or you don't have Swing, what are you going to do to interface and show, display things to the user? Most of the time it's headless, so you don't worry about that. But if you have a multifunction printer, you might want a few buttons so that you can uh, pick and choose your, your print job and control it there. Then also you have limited input. So you have to make sure you, you have, um, you address touch screen or a keypad on your device. And so putting it all together, what are the steps now to take Java embedded suite and do the things I talked about with cloud computing? Well, you would want to deploy to your devices and to, to finally get to that step of deploying to your devices, you would want to write an application, in this case a Java EE web application and provision it as a service. So eventually you're going to use a war bundle or a web application uh, resource bundle that gets downloaded to your device. And you want to provide it with a subscription model because that's normally what you do in cloud, uh, in cloud computing is that you want to say it's using a standard web service model and in our case we're using Jersey inside of the Java embedded suite so that it's a RESTful type of service where you can use the common way of using URLs and HTTP get and put to be able to access data and to 
um, also send it back and forth. Then you need a way to, to add and authenticate users if you're using cloud computing. And this can be done using the Java DB that's found on your device. It's got only one password and one user ID that someone can access into that data. So you want to make sure you have the proper safeguards in place so that your cloud computing is, is secure. And then you want to enable content. So that same Java DB that has the username and passwords in it might also contain all that data that you're collecting such as the uh, smart meter has power consumption data or your irrigation has every time it turns on and turns off it has all that data. It could be huge amounts of big data on that embedded device such as on a factory floor if you're running telemetry on every piece of equipment on that factory floor that could be terabytes of information that each device collects. You can keep it there on a device and not have to use up your bandwidth and use up all that, you know, burn up all your wireless connection. Just keep that in a Java DB database that's on your device and do your predictive analytics on the device. And then do a red flag when, when it's needed, only when it's needed, such as uh, asking a service tech to come over because with predictive analytics you're seeing that a part is going to fail within two weeks because all the data that is being collected is showing there's a trend of uh, a part that's going to wear down and eventually fail. So you could do all kinds of analytics and big data type of processing on those devices now. And so this is big because people keep talking about analytics and big data on servers but we're talking about in our Java embedded group doing this on embedded devices and distributing that idea of big data to the small devices. And then you want to do the normal thing. Yes, there's a question? Is the Okay, so the question is, is Java embedded suite running on the device or on the concentrator? Normally because concentrators have a little more memory, not, not huge like a server, a little bit more memory maybe 512 megabytes uh, instead of 64 megabytes and it has a, uh, it might be a bigger processor like an ARM V7 uh, quad core processor that that's a better place to run Java embedded suite. Especially if you want Java DB and more, me more storage space you might have instead one gigabyte of, of uh, flash memory there. Instead the smart meters you want that very very lightweight and since there's 300 of them you want to keep the cost way way down. So you might put only 64 megabytes there and put a very very low powered 32 bit chip there that's a single core. That not, not as much would be a, a place to run Java embedded suite. Uh, but it's up to you. I, if you're a developer and you find, hey, maybe s distributing Java embedded suite to more, to, to push it down to the lower levels might make more sense in your use case, then you could, you could look at our requirements for Java embedded suite and see if it matches the, the cost effectiveness of your device. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so there's another aspect of cloud computing is that you want to be able to watch all the different services that you're running. You want to be able to operate on them, restart them if necessary, have, have a, a monitor to watch uh, how it's being used, if there's any security concerns, if there's any breaches. And you want to be able to configure and upgrade, send out the newest versions to all those concentrators and be able to diagnose. And when you have Glassfish on all these concentrators, then it makes it much, much easier because you can r run typical Glassfish metrics and, and be able to collect that, that uh, Java EE data from your servers, your, your services running. You might be the, the Glassfish web server running or uh, the version of the application server that's running that you collect all that data from. So that's very straightforward. And then you want flexible deployment. At the very end you're sending one war bundle for each of your applications to your concentrators or your embedded devices so that they can run as web, uh, as cloud services in this case. Any questions on that? Okay. So here's just a, a diagram of what I just said. There's a a tablet that you have that you want to connect up to your concentrators or your, your medical devices on a floor in a hospital. Each concentrator on 
on the floor of a hospital or a wing of a hospital will be running that Java embedded suite 7.0. And, and this goes right to your question here. But if you have devices that are very, very small, you might want to run on, on the right hand side, there's multiple devices, they might be running Java card or they might be running Java ME. They might be running just a subset of Java and not have to do a database there and not have to do Glassfish running there. But they might be just doing things like a uh, heart rate monitor that's, that's watching a driver using JNI um, and collecting all that data but then turn right around and send it to that the nurse's station in that area has a concentrator and say here's all the data I'm just taking it from JNI and native and I'm just giving it to you as the single set top box or gateway or residential gateway that's sitting somewhere close by to me. And so that concentrator will have access to the database or Java DB because it's running Java embedded suite and take all that data from the devices and store it. Then when it's necessary, when it figures out, hey, there's a patient dying in room 101, then the concentrator is going to use the network only then, not continuously streaming, but then send bursty messages saying, hey, there's alert, you should look at this. So that's one of the advantages of this model is that only on demand will the concentrator use the network. And let's get into code because this is a Java 1 session so <laughs> we got to get into a little bit of code. This is a typical way of setting up with Jersey a web service that can act for cloud computing as, as one of the software as a service. And at the very top you see that um, there's a path. So this would become your URL if you had uh, IP address uh, 192.168.1.1. That slash hello world would represent this service. So you can have slash Gmail or slash Flickr or some, some other services running but this one is going to go into this Java class. And, and how many people have done Java EE programming before? Oh, okay, a few, a few. So this would look very old hat that you're setting up, you're, you're describing or using the web application descriptor language to say what your web service is. And so you're saying this is a hello world, you get to it using that path or the URL is going to point to this class. And then you see on line six there's a get um, declaration. This is what's going to happen if somebody uses an HTTP URL and pulls information there from your service. What you produce in line 9 is uh, a MIME type and in this case I'm just saying it's text plain. And then later on it's going to um, do a, a cliched message which is going to return hello world. So that's the whole point of this cloud service. But of course you, you could add, that's where you add all the meat of your program is that it would do analytics there. So let's take a look at how it's implemented. You, first you have your class where you're going to set up using your static initializer in uh, line 19 a way of starting up your server. So you want an HTTP server to start up because you're doing a web service as cloud computing. And this is starting up the hello world resource as a Jersey sample in this case. And so Jersey again is, is just a way, uh, a convenient way of doing a RESTful web service. And it just kind of packages everything together for you. And then in line 25, this is where the class is going to start up whenever you, you are going through that path and it's going to start your HTTP server. So that's just like Apache booting up or if you're booting up Tomcat or, or something on the back end, it's going to start it up and then it's going to offer up that hello world that was the, the service that you're going to uh, get when you're using uh, um, a web browser to access it. So what I'm going to do is um, now demo it on an actual system and I'm going to switch to a different monitor here. And you can see that 
that this is a, a device that I have in my hand is a Linux ARM device. This is a Beagle board. A lot of people were talking about the Raspberry Pi. It's very similar to this Beagle board. A Beagle board has a Linux ARM V7 processor on it and it's great for doing prototypes. It's great for doing your proof of concept and then it will directly apply to when you're ready to uh, install this on, on a system because it's, it's already got that, that standard for Linux ARM on it. It's got Ethernet, it's got USB, it's got uh, a memory card. So everything about it is just bundled really nicely. And it's the same with the Raspberry Pi so that you can develop and go. And I'm going to switch over to concentrate on the screen here. This is NetBeans and again if you wanted to use Eclipse or you wanted to use JDeveloper that's fine. It's all Java SE so that's, that's a good part of Java SE embedded is anything that will allow you to develop for Java desktop will allow you to develop also for Java SE embedded. There's no change to it. And what I did here was I created this package as a project that is a web service project. So anyone, there, there's quite a few people that already have done Java EE uh, service programming. Just create a web service and you're going to be off and running um, on these little tiny devo devices like Raspberry Pi or BeagleBoard if you're using Java Embedded Suite. And this is showing you exactly the same way as in my slides. You set up a path. I'm just saying generic here so that um, it just goes to a URL and then it has some type of context and it's going to do some type of get operation. And that's it. That's very, very small lines of code, <laughs> very, very small amount of, of coding that you would have to do to say on a get call to this URL, it's going to do this type of processing. I only have one line but of course you could put all your analytics here of going to JNI, grabbing data from your native drivers to the temperature sensor or the heart rate monitor or the power consumption on a smart meter. Do something with it, save it to your database and then return back, since it's a web service, H HTML. And that's what I talked about, that one client that is HTML standard client would be able to, to take this and display it properly. So that's, that's all that you need. You can also have put uh, HTTP put, put do other types of more complicated data uh, interaction between your client. But get is, is pretty standard if you don't have a lot of data to send back and forth. And I'm going to go ahead and run it. So this builds it in NetBeans and it's the same way in Eclipse. And it's going to have a, a deployable um, war file and then it shows it running and that's as, as simple as you get for a hello world. Very straightforward. This is going to the URL and the package or my web service if, you do, if you've done Java EE programming and it gets back this HTML after doing its processing. Are there any questions about this? This is typical Java EE web service programming. Okay. So now I'll show you how easy it is to deploy. So when you do that build that I just did, inside a NetBeans, inside a NetBeans project, you can go to the disk directory or distribution. There's only one file. It's a war file. It's got all your web service descri description and the, the byte codes and the jar file. It's all in there. You take that and you you copy it over or you push it over. You can even use OSGI. OSGI is, is, is a wonderful framework that you can say push these out to my 300 devices. And that war file will show up on your device. So my device actually is connected with a serial connection. And let me just clear this. Just, just so that you can see there's no tricks, nothing up my sleeve here. Let's do a cat of the CPU info and it's showing that it's an ARMv6 processor. It's, it says, uh, I believe it's supposed to be an 800 megahertz chip so it's showing Bogle MIPS of about 730. And then um, it's showing you, yes indeed, this is a Beagle board. The OMAP3 ARM chip is on here. And it's um, actually Angstrom Linux so I think in our, in the Etsy 
there's the in information on Angstrom version, yeah. So it's running Angstrom. So what, what you do to start up that war file, after you've, you've copied it over or OSGI pushes it over, um, there's a little bit of formatting here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you guys, let me bring this up here. Oh, that's better. So let me go back here and uh, just so that you saw that. Okay, so let me just show that it was uh, CPU info here. And that's the Beagle board. And then I'm going to run, that's the Angstrom version. And then I'm going to run the actual war file. So the war file was distributed over here either OSGI or you pushed it out over the network with FTP or some other way. I'm going to just start it up just like you would with a regular Glassfish host script. And what that's doing is it's taking the war file, it's, it's validating it, making sure that everything is, is good um, and then it's starting up the, the HTTP server and then finally it's going to deploy the war file. So you see that happening here. So as it's doing that then of course you would want to do this um, maybe periodically so that you can update your war files and, and have that be uh, flexible so that uh, if there's any bugs or any security updates you can make sure to push that out to your, all your devices. And then that in turn will start up the server here and you can see um, uh, and I don't have an Ethernet hub, but what you would do is you would point the same web page to your device, and instead of local hosts, this would be pointed to the URL and the IP address of your device, and you would see the same thing, hello world. But, you know, since I don't have my Ethernet hub set up, you just have to take my word for it that this is the same output you would get. I'm going to show, though, um, that it is running the WAR file because after you're done with it, you hit enter and you can see it's undeploying the war file now, the same, uh, same thing that it started up and it's stopping here. You can see it was indeed running the Glassfish server and now it cleanly comes out of that. So that kind of just demonstrates how easy it is from beginning to end of a web service, pushing it out to your device, using Java Embedded Suite to start up that cloud service and be able to access it over the network. So I'm going to switch over back to my slides. Okay, there is a question, is there a tutorial on Java Embedded Suite on the website? Yes, we, we have more. Right now it's a, a start guide, getting started guide. And um, I could I could update either my blog or I'll put it somehow with the slides so that you can access that. But if you, if you Google or do your favorite web search engine for um, Java Embedded Suite for Oracle download, you, you should be able to also find in that same page where you download the Getting Started Guide. They, they, they put a nice web page for that type of um, uh, ability. We have a, a nice license for it because you can try before you buy. Any developer here can just download for free Java Embedded Suite, have it running on a Beagle board or Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is $35. So to start up and start developing is, is, is really cheap to just play around with, do your proof of concept. But yeah, you could try for free and do your development for free. When you're ready to deploy or if you have a paying customer then you come to Oracle and talk to us at that point. But you, you don't have to worry until then. You can just um, look at our online s guides and web pages. If you have questions on anything specific then you can come up and I'll, I'll give you my business card and, and you can contact me also. Any other questions about job embedded, about the cloud computing model that we have or? No? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll be hanging out here so you can come up if uh, there's anything else that comes to mind. And uh, this concludes this part of the talk and I uh, hope you enjoyed the conference. Thank you very much.